How so. should we start? Um, gosh, it is intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> In a very public kind of way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well... I was just actually very interested in your immediate response to the introduction before we actually catch up, I think, on each other's work um, to this idea that um, sort of the implicit idea that you kind of build up knowledge in order to act mm. as opposed to um, you act in order to produce knowledge yes. and that kind yeah. of reversal that kind of you established that there's no linear you know you acquire and accumulate yes. knowledge yes. Yes. and particularly in the Anthropocene where <coughs> there's kind of what I I think the climate crisis the Anthropocene has created this or revealed this kind of insidious crisis the, yes. the crisis of agency where you know, what do we do in the face of so many challenges it produces this extraordinary crisis of agency and sort of buying a new shopping bag <laughs> or changing a light bulb or riding your bicycle to work. I mean, necessary but radically insufficient right. in terms of... So I want to hear your immediate response to this idea of building up knowledge in order to act. Right, certainly. Um, do you think we're speaking loudly enough, Natalie? I, I know that I don't speak loudly. I think I can. We, I think we could actually whisper in them. <laughs> I, well, I guess we'll never know. Will <laughs> yes. we? um, yeah, my reaction is not not just not especially to the opening remarks from Jürgen Moran, but <coughs> maybe to the whole premise of the Anthropocene project, which seems to make knowledge the absolute centre of what we need to be concerned with if we're going to deal with the problems of the Anthropocene, um, as if everything flows from knowledge. Right. Um, my own idea is that that's not right, that knowledge is part of the business of getting along in the world, but it's not the center, it doesn't control it. For me, the important thing in the world is performance, doing things in a lively world which acts back on us. That's the kind of substrate of our being in the world. And knowledge is something which kind of evolves along with it rather than being the kind of controlling centre of anything. And of course, to talk about knowledge is to uh, centre the discourse on what's so special about humanity. And this is a kind of, I would say, human exceptionalist position, which goes with the kind of dualism of thinking that we're in charge, we're active, we know what's going on, and we can control a passive world. If we understand it, we can make it do our bidding. If there's one thing that the Anthropocene teaches us, mm -hmm. is that that ain't the case, right? right? <laughs> right. And our performances are coming back to haunt us at the level of performance. Uh, global warming being a very obvious example. Yes. I mean, I, you know, the crisis of agency, maybe this is an interesting thing we could discuss. I mean, your example was something to do with shopping, right? Um, whereas I would say the crisis is more at the level of patterns of action, ways of going on, ways of standing in the world. It doesn't mean that... Um, we're in different camps. But it does seem to me that we're talking... At slightly different level. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's a, actually a critical discussion be, um, because <clears throat> uh, the way that I've framed what I've um, been doing is specifically in order to perform, right? That the, um, that the crisis of agency as I experience it, and, and I gave an example during the campus that, um, that I didn't quite as you know, young faculty, I, I had two students come to me. I was very unprepared for this. As I'd been un, uh, identified as a kind of greenie. What, what actually, my my um, my dean of engineering called me his um, fuzzy social science tree hugging engineer, <laughs> <laughs> which I took as a compliment. Of course, he was the um, former he was a science advisor to Reagan, and the um, anyway. 
two of my students in, um, in, within a year came to me and said, you know, I'm a good environmentalist, I don't eat meat, I print on both sides of the paper, I turn off my lights, um, but wouldn't suicide be the best <laughs> option, right? And then, you know, then I'll reduce my carbon footprint, then I'll reduce, then I'll, I'll, I'll use less paper, then I'll, you know, right. and this whole idea that our, um, that the way that the kind of in, um, received environmentalism is it sort of do uh, reduce your impact, reduce your uh, do do not touch, leave no trace. This whole thing of um, trying to reduce, as opposed to claiming that you can act or that you can do anything mm. and that you could make it good, right? So that the kind of crisis of agency of of the, you know these suicidal students um, really earnestly not not believing there's any creative agency. And so, you know, it's partly in response to mm. that, the environmental health clinic, which is how I mm. frame the work, so that this then changes global climate change or global biodiversity uh, loss or global energy systems into environmental things into you know, health issues and health issues into environmental issues, which, of course, renders them... You know, in the air quality in this room, in the food systems we depend on, in the shared water and soil biodiversity, and and that means we can act on them, right? And then we can act in our own interests. And um, and the idea that anything I do to improve my own air quality, indoor air quality, or outdoor air quality, or reduce my child's risk of of asthma mm. you know the benefits are enjoyed by anyone i share that air quality with so it has this implicit critique of a um, internal genetically predisposed um, atomized individuals medicalized pharmaceuticalized view of health into an external view of health that of course hippocrates himself you know to treat the inner one must treat the outer in airs waters and places Initiated this idea that uh, that we that we can act to self-determine and manage our own health where we have agency, and figuring out where you can act and giving um, giving ourselves permission to act to explore mm. possibilities mm. is exactly what the work that I've been doing in the, in this framework that um, that you know, is this much more lively engagement with the material possibilities and the actualities that, you know, of yeah. this great challenge we face of how do we reimagine and redesign our relationship to natural yeah. systems. And I, I, I think I understand how your work kind of goes in that direction and it seems to me to be very important. Um, your work, as far as I can make it, uh, and maybe you've got some more examples. I, you know, I mean, uh, kind of creates new interfaces or uh, connections to you know, specific bits of the world and kind of reads things out from them and connects them to other things, you know, social systems, economic systems, and makes them available for you know, consideration and action right. Right, at, right. at a rather specific level. I, I mean, I, I suspect, you know, we, we think, it, <laughs> we talk at different levels. Um, so what I hear in your phrase, the crisis of action... Of agency, the crisis of... agency, of, sorry, yeah. yeah. It's a very uh, human-centred uh, way of speaking. Um, by agency, I mean, I would mean something like performance, doing things in the world action um, and I see the world itself as a kind of multiplicity of agencies the world itself is lively yeah. I couldn't really speak of a crisis of agency in that sense I mean we're, we're all nobody can stop me performing and doing things and the same goes for the world it's always acting in ways that often surprise us. Sure, and and what I find interesting is that that uh, 
Um, I'm really interested in actually rendering non-human agency. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you a couple of concrete examples because I think it, it helps a lot, yeah. particularly starting here um, with, for instance, the the tree office that um, is just outside. And, um, you know, the idea of this is, in fact, to look at the tree. So this is actually a tree office, which is an tree. office and a tree. And I haven't out. seen it. You walked past it on the way in. It's it's a, it was, it's it was a delightful inside. place. But here, this is a different one that I built. So the yeah. idea of the tree office is that, um, you know, it's an office in a tree with high-speed internet and locally generated power, and, and it's a lovely place to work. But the conceit is that it's owned and operated by the tree. The tree <laughs> is the landlord, and the tree is who, you know, uh, who you pay your hot desk and your co-working. Your, that's your landlord, right? That's who you, you pay. And so... <laughs> Um, and of course, this is repositioning the idea of um, the tree as a, you know, the dominant paradigm of environmental services, where we value a tree by the services it provides in air quality improvements or stormwater sequestering, you know, carbon sequestering. Yeah. Um, all of the environmental services it provides: habitat provisioning, energy savings from shade provisions, you know, the um, uh, this uh, adds up in New York City that the, a tree is worth for 80 years of its life $400. <laughs> in uh, Germany, it's 1,000 euro. Um, so uh, this uh, tree landlord, I mean, this one in particular, was generating $400 a month from... Actually, it was 1,000... This one here for the membership is, so, you know, it changes the, it's more consistent with this rights of nature idea that, like the Bolivian Rights of Earth document and this idea that we could extend rights discourse away from mm. the humans into non-humans. And that, of course, has tremendous consequence for giving things legal personality so that a river, for instance, if it were trashed by a mining company, would have, instead of finding a person who could prove damages that could then sue the mining company, the river itself could have, <laughs> uh, of course, um, sue for damages, right? So this idea that we could extend these useful legal concepts that have worked to um, be extended first to blacks and then to women and yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to non-humans recognises the agency of non-humans and um, repositions them. Or in, you know, a couple of other examples that I think are really interesting uh, in terms of there's a, um, the, for instance, the butterfly bridge. Yes, I like that. So that's, um, uh, you know, quite simply connecting the patches of habitat that constitute the actual biodiversity, urban biodiversity, where, of course, our cities have become islands of biodiversity. Um, and by, you know, by creating a, a butterfly bridge, the butterflies are attracted to the... They bounce across, and instead of being smeared on your mm -hmm. windscreen, they become, you know, they safely move. So it's an overpass to provide safe passage for butterflies, but, of course, it makes their fleeting presence much more durable as we... Um, yeah. Recognized and visible. and visible, and that idea. I mean, I suppose one other quick example, which one of the tropes of, of that I'm interested in is giving voice, quite literally translating for non-humans. So the Salamander Superhighway, for instance, like the Butterfly Bridge, connects. You know, these are migratory animals that are the base of the uh, the food web in the verdant northeast, in fact, all over North America. Critical um, organisms that everybody depends on, all the migrating birds, all the small mammals, all of them. Um, and so this is a micro-speed bump that when you drive over, it reminds yeah. you you're not alone. It's not for the salamanders. You no, know, the salamanders like actually, them down. they go through, <laughs> they go through. And inside there's a PIR sensor so that when they go through, they'll tweet, you know, hi, honey, I'm coming home. Or <laughs> actually the Socratic salamander, because this is in um, Socrates Sculpture Park, where it's, you know, what comes first, the salamander or the migration route. And so, again, giving voice to 
uh, or making present these organisms that we um, haven't accounted for, mm. certainly haven't integrated into urban infrastructure, even though they form the basis of a functioning, healthy urban context. So it's, you know, this is um, cross-species highway signage because they read this, the temperature dif differential with their bellies. Um, <laughs> and can translate it. But the, the, I mean, there's a, a whole lot of examples where I think non-human agency can be made mm. very clear. And maybe this is one because uh, the rhinoceros beetle wrestling, <laughs> um, which is another example of using sports, which is a institutionalized form that is paradoxical in so much as um, actually, what I find interesting is the <coughs> arguments to put in um, plastic um, turf in in playing fields um, is a, is an environmental argument because actually to have turf there, toxic turf, would create more runoff and damage and <laughs> pesticides than the plastic ones. So we pr we design and play these sports and these institutions as sports that actually reduce environmental health while purportedly mm. increasing human health. So are there sports that we can reimagine that do the sensible thing of improving human and environmental health? You know, they're coupled, that they're interrelated, that they're co-evolving. So this is one of them, which is um, rhinoceros beetle wrestling, <laughs> which um, takes the... Uh, rhinoceros beetle forces and scales them to human scale and human forces and scales them to beetle <laughs> scale so that uh, you put on your head mounted display man versus beast you <laughs> you wrestle with the rhinoceros beetle and of course oh. I take wages on, on <laughs> man versus beast but the idea that if you have a sport that's dependent on these again critical organisms that are so biomechanically impossible because they they churn the rhizomic sphere they lift up logs you know they they um, create the <laughs> microbial diversity that um, you know if we had a high school sport uh, that depended on these <laughs> and I offer a, I offer a scholarship to my program at NYU to rhinoceros beetle wrestling and we could <laughs> we would have these rhinoceros beetles so so um, so anyway again creating um, a little known urban non-human and changing their agency changing their capacity yeah. to to produce the kind of desirable future that, that accounts for these multiple agents and these complex um, uh, interactions that constitute you know lived experience so I would call this <laughs> which is yeah. experiences I, I would call it uh, yeah I clearly that the experience of you know the f wondrous fascination of how strong the rhinoceros beetle is mm is, um, you know, well, why are they so strong and, and what could they, you know, and it, it generates the possibilities of using, uh, you know, collaborating with these non-humans to, to figure out. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. Um, but I suppose there's one more example, because this is the one that I want to try on you, <laughs> given kind of the convention of... I should be writing notes on this. <laughs> you, no, 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 no. Um, but it's it's the what, you know there's there's two strategies that that I I suppose are primary here about um, the kind of the public experiment that it's that it's visible as you pointed out and that it is material mm. and there's a kind of irreducibility about that that's interesting but the one that I'm particularly interested in getting your opinion on or your take on is this one the muscle choir um, which is again this trope of making non-humans in this case sing so sing, the, sing <laughs> yeah so that's <laughs> these guys who are blue muscles international um, you know they're everywhere and they are, are the heavy lifters of water quality improvements and there's a whole lot of interesting old theories about how 
humans have co-evolved with muscles, right? And that we owe them our frontal cortex, actually. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is a midden theory of human evolution, which I'm really interested in. But for, for the purposes of this, this muscle choir actually is these muscles that are instrumented with um, a sensor um, so that I know when they open and close. And, of course, how they open and close tells us a lot about water quality. Mm. And so I turn that behavior into song. This is actually the touring band, the rock band of the Muscle Choir. So <laughs> on. you can see there they are singing up on stage. <laughs> but, you know, the question is, what does a muscle choir sing? And, of course, their first hit single is, <laughs> um, is uh, based on... On this guy, you know, um, you know this, the first computer synthesized voice. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this is why Siri, if you ask it, her, him to, to sing you a song, yeah. it'll sing this, right? And that's why Hal in 2001 sings this. It's because. When he goes mad. When he goes mad. When he regresses. <laughs> he regresses to this. That was the. Um, so this is the kind of icon of AI. Artificial intelligence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, that's a kind of trope that actually Aaron Coblin um, in uh, this is not a bicycle built for two, but a bicycle built for 2000, and it's 2000 Amazon Mechanical Turkers singing, uh, uh, and that all being assembled into a bicycle built for 2000. <laughs> Um, and so the first hit single of the Muscle Choir is not a bicycle built for two and not a bicycle built for 2,000, but a bicycle built for too many, <laughs> which, um, of course, is... This is the Muscle Choir in Venice, and their pitch is uh, mapped to their depth, and so, actually, I think you can hear them. Anyway, so that's the muscle singing the bicycle built for um, too many. And that's what I... Um, the idea that you can use these active, you know, intelligent organisms, this idea of not artificial intelligence, not that kind of cynical Amazon mechanical Turk view of distributed intelligence, this idea of natural intelligence where you're drawing on the representation and the multi-parameter responses to the actual complex, irreducibly complex ecological conditions mm. that um, instead of trying to model as many parameters as computationally practical in some, you know, water quality monitoring, some sort of model, um, in fact, we kind of open it to the lively input of these organisms and render it so it's culturally available in situ empirical, mm. experimental, and that's what I'd like to kind of put in contrast to AI and the bounded computational model, NI, or natural intelligence, and the open-ended, mm. um, complex, irreducibly complex uh, representation of socio-ecological systems that are always responding and reacting back and, and, and talking back. So that kind of mangle of practice mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. have advocated um, is, I would argue, is what these guys are performing and how they're, what they're singing about, actually. And I think it's a hopeful song. I would <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so give me your response to natural intelligence as, a, as an appropriation of the opportunity that these new distributed sensors and smart city technologies have, you know, have given us um, to... Redesign our relationship to natural systems. Yeah, um, it, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I think what your work does, you know, very beautifully and effectively, is to kind of uh, couple us into non, into the non-human world, organisms, things. These are kind of giving a read out on the water when they're singing, presumably. Yes. I think it confronts us beautifully with the, the idea of. Uh, nature, the world in general, as a lively place. I think a lot of artists, though I don't know why they call themselves artists, are trying to do this thing. And you, <laughs> you do it better than <laughs> a lot of them, right? I mean, you've actually, 
got some very effective ways of <coughs> dramatizing the, the agency of nature. Uh, it, it does seem to me that you're kind of, in a way, speaking a double language. So you started off by talking about extending rights to trees, and you ended up by describing this coupling to the muscles as showing their intelligence. Why should I give a damn where the muscles are intelligent? I mean, they, it might be better to be clear on the otherness of these things. That they might sing, but you can't have a conversation like this with a muscle. I don't think mm -hmm. having a conversation like this is the center of anything. Right. It, it's a very peculiar kind of performative interaction, having a conversation. Right. Um, so, so does it matter to to claim intelligence, I suppose. Well, is I mean, one way of talking is that any lively system, you end up calling it, saying it's, got, it's intelligent or it's got a mind. That's the way a lot of cyberneticians spoke. I think you feel like saying that if you're in the center of a human-centered discourse, you know, and you're trying to be modest. So I've got a mind and so have the muscles. You know, I've got rights, so have the trees. Um, you know, it might be that for the purposes of getting to grips with the Anthropocene, we ought to get rid of this asymmetric vocabulary. Um, it's not a matter of seeing the rest of the world as being somehow extensions of us or versions of us. I, and, and, you know, the other thing that doesn't come across here, I mean, if we're talking about you know, the mango of practice and the dance of agency, it doesn't, you, you're thematizing the agency of the muscles, but there's no kind of human adaptation to that, and there's no adaptation of the muscles to the human. I, well, I like I, your butterflies, right? I would argue, I would argue the, the, the difference. And the salamanders. I would, kind of. I would argue the, the, the... I would argue the... Uh, I mean, and, and certainly this is a group of projects that I would, I would talk about as the unsure line because there's the big cultural challenge that we face of of redesigning our relationship to between terrestrial and aquatic systems given that 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 boundary has been so challenged um, and and the vocabulary to actually design with living systems mm. i.e muscles and the mega metropolises of muscles and why they're actually interesting uh, you know cohabitants you know they form these they filter more water than any other um, organism they uh, form huge mega metropolises that absorb wave, wave energy mm. um, as opposed to there's a whole kind of oyster muscle thing there's a whole lot of oyster <laughs> people. I'm very much on the muscle side. The oysters <laughs> form these rigid um, uh, reefs that are uh, fewer in number and, and don't have the pliancy and uh, their muscles can live three times as long, like up to 80 years. Whereas, anyway, so there's a whole <laughs> lot of virtues and interesting things. So how do we then design our systems, our urban systems, so that we do cohabit and recognize their presence, their value, their, um, we've been listening to their hearts recently, we have, I've got some little hearts, so they have three hearts, so the muscle heartbeat, um, actually the recordings that I have are from the oyster heartbeat that form the baseline of the new muscle uh, choir song, but this idea of, um, it doesn't presuppose that there is uh, I mean, I, I think we can only design as if we are where we are, right? There's no kind of getting outside or beyond our position, but there is a recognition of the opportunities that these, you know, collaborations with these non-humans provide. So in this case, um, this is actually supporting muscle ropes, but, you know, it's a set of buoys that light up when fish go underneath. Um, mm. And yes, there is an ongoing, so the muscles grow, the buoys support them, they attract the fish, an uh, entire ecosystem. You can, uh, you can text the fish, the fish text you back, you can see they're there, 
Um, and this whole idea that you do um, change how you interact with and that there's a feedback cycle. So not only do you see the fish there, not only can you text them, you can also feed the fish, mm. right? So that sets up this feedback cycle that fish know when the lights go on, food is likely to be there. People know when the lights go on, fish are likely to be there. And then this um, lure that um, I developed, you know, is a cross-species food where it's made of gelin, which is an algae derivative, so it's nutritionally appropriate. It fluoresces because... Uh, it's gin and tonic, actually. Um, it fluoresces very nicely, but also because fish see in UV. But it has a medical grade chelating agent in it, so that as you feed fish, it binds to the bioaccumulated heavy metals and PCBs, complexes into a less reactive form. They poop it out. And uh, the small interactions of many individuals can aggregate into collective remediative action which I would posit as a very different type of interaction than how we design our shorelines now and currently on the other side of the Manhattan Island um, up the Hudson dredges dredging toxic sludge shipping off to <coughs> Pennsylvania or the nearest third world country where it continues to be toxic sludge that whole displacement idea that will make it or take it somewhere else and make it someone else's problem, as opposed to the in-situ aggregation of many actions into something productive uh, and um, responsive and um, radically different. Yes, and I think yes, it's yes. that kind of architecture reciprocity that, that I think is implied in your work, mm -hmm. um, that the material speaks back, that the uh, that the you know that people are active agents and the whole kind of do not feed the animals, do not touch, do right. not um, is is breached, so that we can explore what agency we do have to produce a desirable future, to act on our local environments, to to you know can we. Uh, so it's these small scale material experiments that I think give us the capacity to extend, adapt, change, um, cover the island with these buoys that support mussels or, or not, right? That, yeah. And um, as opposed to the master plan yeah. that yeah. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers... Or, so these are kind of... I recognise the kind of experimental paradigm that you point to in much of your description of how actual, what scientists actually do, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. But breaks down, breaks through um, the stranglehold that, you know, particularly in our shared uh, in environmental commons, particularly our shared urban spaces, who can act on them, who can change them, who can, you know, do anything is highly constrained yeah. and and how you get through or past or beyond that I would argue is a very difficult process yes okay very good I think, <laughs> I think I've got it um, I, I, I think you know <laughs> we agree on everything but we develop it in a different direction so um your fish that you can send texts to and that light up things right? is a, a beautiful example of what I would call ontological theatre. It's a kind of theatre that shows us, for me, how the world is in general. It's theatre because it's contrived, but it's generally a fact that we're engaged in these kind of... Uh, <coughs> decentered, emergent dances of agency with the world in any possible aspect. Right? Um, that's what I want to say. You want to bring it down to those fish, and what the question is: What are we going to do about those fish? Or, um, whereas whereas I, yeah. the, the toxic sludge thing is, um, 
acting out ontological theatre, a very different image of what the world is like. It's a kind of dualist one where there are things which are just passive and human beings which are different and we're active and we're in control of the things. We don't like the sludge we'll move. Um, so what we need, you know, the paradigm of earthbound knowledge for the Anthropocene would be this understanding that we're actually coupled to things. We're not in command of anything. Right. Um, right. I suppose the difference might be that, you know, you're, you are concerned with that bay or those trees that you planted in Palo Alto. Right, right. Whereas my idea is, you know, a much more desperate one, which is if I could persuade people to understand the world as being, you know, decentered and emergent, that we aren't in control of anything, then, you know, every project in the world could be reconsidered from that standpoint. So a lot of the kind of projects of domination, which you know, <coughs> commanding the Mississippi River to right. stay in this channel, not to right. go down that channel, not to flat, right. would start to seem ridiculous, right? Right. because the world isn't that sort of a place. The desperate quest for more and more oil would start to seem right. But I, 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 well, there's two things that I think are worth. Um, saying about first of all I rail at the kind of theater reference Don't you do? <laughs> yes I do because it's uh, even though I think part of the work is creating a kind of a legible spectacle yeah, yeah. but the kind of the idea of calling something performance I would argue you know in in, in my realm mm. is to kind of make it an exception Right. Uh, right. And to I, say, I okay, to make it an icon, a yeah. mnemonic, right? But an so exemplar. the problem <laughs> that I run into is that, yeah, that oh, this becomes you know that buoys become a little attraction, a little cute little you know decorative thing that's bracketed <laughs> off from yeah, right, what right. the real world is, and you know, you, like you can go home after the theatre performance, right? And yeah. nothing changes, so it's a suspension yes. of normality, but um, then the real world goes on. Whereas I want to see them as experiments, right, where they actually have, they're there, they're still there, they don't go away, right. and that they actually do suggest, well, does this work? Is this working here? Could it work further? Could it, you know, could, you know, that idea that we can take these material demonstrations and extend them into the new vocabulary that that you're talking about. So I want to show this, this and try on my new terminology of um, I came across this idea of mutualistic I came across this little reference in some some computational modeling um, papers that I was reading about um, trying to model mutualism and then I kept, came across it again and I kept and I thought wow I've never read that before and I've done a lot of you know formal education <laughs> and uh, I came across this little line that said um, the reason why they were modeling mutualism is because it's interesting because most of the world's biomass are mutualists that is all the corals all the basically all terrestrial plants all flowers and insects or and i read you know i knew about mutualism as a subset of symbiotic relationships the, the subset that actually both parties benefit mm. um i'd heard a lot more about selective pressure and predator prey relationships yeah. and resource competition i had never heard that most of the world's biomass, by a long shot, are mutualists, yeah. this tiny little subset. And that's, you know, interesting, radically interesting to me. I've tested all my students, all my computational biology friends, everyone. Do you know this little, this little fact that actually <laughs> that's how the world works, is <laughs> mutualism? No, right? <laughs> Certainly none of the computational biologists. Um, and, and I find that, you know, there is so much mutualism around, which is this entangled, you know, in a biological sense, this absolute... Um, irreducible complexity of interrelationship that you're pointing to mm. that I think is is you know we're so immersed and we can't recognize it we're like fish and water and so for instance this project you know I've been doing this pharmacy for a long time um, where I take railings parapets and double hung windows and convert them into arable territory with this Tyvek based um, 
uh, uh, planting um, strategy. And so recently I've been um, doing, concentrating on these larger deployments where I've actually been cross-dressing buildings. You can see here. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Oh, wait, really? Goodness. <laughs> so this is a cross-dress building, um, which has... Uh, so you can see this is these ag bags that are now um, in what would be commercial signage space. And so I want to use this as a concrete example of mutualistic systems design that's recognizable. So you can advertise whatever the hell you like, but in addition to promoting whatever human-centric activity or um, uh, thing that you want to promote, you're also increasingly fairy index, improving air quality and the human health benefits mm -hmm. from that. You're supporting pollinators and you're exploring these delicious new edible flowers, which are <laughs> the high nutrition value, high yeah. commercial value. So this idea that you can have you can design uh, mutualistic systems is, you know, the, this is increasingly the, uh, the strategy that I think captures that entanglement mm. that, you're, that you've pointed to, but gives it the authority of recognizing in a natural system that this is actually, you know, a, a natural template the template of natural systems authorizes this as an approach, not as an oddity, but as um, a realization that we can and could design with intention um, that we could produce the kind of mutualistic systems that um, I think recognize that interrelationship that you're that you're describing. Yes, yes, very, very nice. Natalie, um, <laughs> you know, in the 30 seconds we have remaining to this, I mean, I could think of three things we could have discussed. One, how do you convey that to people? And, you know, I don't think it's enough just to put up some system and, and think people are going to understand it. So there has to be some kind of words or text to go with it. Um, I, I'm... Having been reading about deep, deep ecology in my class the other week, um, Arne Ness, one of the founders, was convinced that um, to achieve a, a decentering of the human in nature, people had to change. We had to become different kinds of selves. And I think he's kind of right. You know, I think all of our, our, our education makes us into these dualist beings. We can talk our way out of it. But Ness's idea was that we have to become something different. Um, and the third question, <laughs> for the remaining 25 seconds, is... Um, yeah, we have minutes. We have minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear more of your... How, how would you attach your work to work that wasn't about our relation to organisms and the environment? Because I don't think we want the environment and ecology to be a self-contained topic. If we're going to... Right take the message of the Anthropocene seriously, um, it would be beautiful to try and connect your work with, you know, kind of approaches to radical psychiatry, maybe complexity theory and mutualism, different approaches to management. Um, you know, I, and then I drift off into spirituality because, you know, the overall image of what being in the world is like is one of kind of decentered flows and becomings, and we're caught up in it all, which is what the Taoists knew 2,000 years ago. Um, how would you get away from these concrete examples and latch them onto all of these other spheres of practice and action? Yeah, I actually, uh, I think by specifically staying very modest, concrete, <laughs> and um, that these become ex ex examples that can realize these larger, unwieldy, often unrecognizable topics, right? So in answer to your first question, um, this idea that you... Um, I mean, one of the issues that I... 
I think actually produces knowledge, you know, how you can recognize this without text, without, um, is, is the materiality, you know. So I think that actually I'll give a, there's two final examples that I think really explore the, um, uh, this idea of, this is from a sandcastle competition where um, I had my cross-species construction firm there um, who didn't win. But this is in Far Rockaway Beach, which was eviscerated by Sandy, right? right. Totally eviscerated. And um, we had the sandcastle competition because they just dumped all this nice sand on there, the biggest beach they had in 30 years. The sceptical locals were there saying, yeah, enjoy this beach, it'll be gone next year, right? And so we had the sandcastle competition. And I had um, all of my organisms who actually do build beaches there. Mm. So including Enrico Penalosa, the fish. <laughs> um, so all of the organisms were named after local politicians or, or politicians who have produced public space. <laughs> and he was a diggity fish and he was supposed to be digging. But when, when I put him in, he didn't. He sulked, he wouldn't perform. No performance whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we lost the sandcastle competition. I blamed it on Enrico. But I took him home and I... Um, uh, and I realized that over the next few weeks, the, um, I kept getting these algae blooms. And I didn't know why. I'd never had algae blooms before. And it I wasn't see. until Enrique... <laughs> you were getting that. <laughs> well, Enrique um, jumped out and suicided. <laughs> and I tried to resuscitate him. And I, it was then that I realized it was a sand. It was mined from somewhere up in, you know, somewhere else, right, right. dumped here. And after a superstorm, you know, uh, anything that survived is now leaching all the nutrients out and creating algae blooms. And what I was seeing in my little pocket ecosystem was happening here. Right. So they re-put the boardwalk back on exactly how it was, the same boardwalk that lifted off and rammed into cars and buildings, and they put it back on. And this whole idea, can we change, can we adapt, um, can we radically rethink? Um, and so the, this, this actually, this material came out of Lord of the Rings, it's uh, polycarbonate rings, and I think it's a game changer, right? But um, so putting this on the boardwalk, where I'm doing this little public experiment where you put this in, and of course the, everyone can see uh, the June grasses underneath that actually, you know, there's 100% solar throughput, so you're not cutting off all the biogeochemical processes that actually build beaches and secure beaches. And then you can ride your bike over it, you can take your stroller over it, you can't wear stilettos, it's not great for stilettos or rollerblades. Um, but, you know, also by doing the material experiment mm. in public, those locals came along and said, oh, the next time the storm surge comes along, it will go straight through. It won't lift off, right? Yeah. So that kind of mutual discovery that I think can align these different expertise once you have this kind of public shared material experience allows for the, you know, the spiritual, the, you know, mental, you know, the, the, like. whatever you like, <laughs> the interpretive flexibility of how the material world speaks back to us that, that I think is really interesting. And the, sort of the one example that I would finish with is this X-Gun project, which I think also structures participation in an interesting way. So it takes the kind of unique technological opportunity that we can now do on board digital signal processing and we can print our own guns and we can um, take advantage of electronic detonation which increases lethality of guns by uh, an order of magnitude which is a strange thing but by taking those three technological opportunities we can take our guns and of course it means that this is the X gun or what was originally the bullet bouncer backer a gun so this is you can you have to finish I'm going to I'm going to finish anyway. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, it was. <laughs>